This video will include old and new information about data annotation, specifically revamping my starter and core guides. Most importantly, I cleaned up the audio to remove that annoying, to some, <laughs> audio track that drowned out my voice. Also, I will include additional information and even answer some commonly asked questions. So, if you're new here, you're in the best possible place. If you've seen my original videos on the topic, it's still worth it to stick around and get additional information, if you want it. And before we jump into the main video, I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to everyone who supports my channel by watching. It really means a lot. If you want to support even more, channel memberships are now active and they come with some helpful perks. Members in the fan tier for just $1.99 a month get access to my videos three days early, which can be useful if you want a little extra head start when applying to any jobs that I may cover. You also get access to any bonus entertainment videos I make, such as casual Let's Plays of video games that I enjoy, which I won't be posting directly on the main channel. For those who want more direct help, I also have a $9.99 tier that gives you exclusive chat access to me for any questions you may have about exams, applications, or just getting started. And if you prefer Patreon, good news. I offer the same perks over there, as well as the same exact pricing. So with that being said, let's jump into the first video. This will be my data annotation starter assessment guide. For those of you unaware, this is actually just part one of a two-part test. Yes, if you didn't see the second one immediately pop up, you actually failed. So while I can't talk about the exact test, I can give some relevant examples. Let's just say that. So for the first few starting questions, it's going to be pretty basic, just some sort of like, you know, demographic questions, you know, race, ethnicity, that kind of stuff. And for the first question here, we're going to have how many people does Whole Foods employ? And I actually answered this in my original video, but I'm going to clarify it a little bit better here. And just for some quick clarification for those wondering why I just simply went with the AI overview. Uh, there's a few reasons. The first is this question is actually multiple choice. So I was essentially just skimming to see what number actually matches. And second, what wasn't shown in the original video was that the entire screen also has other websites verifying that information and websites that we would actually trust, such as Whole Foods Market, uh, Wikipedia. In this instance, it just wasn't shown in the original video. So no, do not just blindly trust the AI overview, but definitely utilize it where possible. Bye. Okay, now to ramp up the difficulty just a little bit. What is the closing price of Facebook for May 5th? And we want the closing price. So just double check that you're not actually looking at the open, the high, the low. You want the closing price for that day. For questions like these, we always want to verify that this information is correct and it's not just returning a random value or a hallucination. So that's why it's important to verify the information on a reputable site such as Yahoo Finance when it comes to stock values. And so the closing price would be $599.27. And our next prompt's going to be, which one of these poems do you prefer? So the two poems are, a lantern swings in the ocean breeze, its glow a whisper through the trees. The stars lean low to kiss the tide, and night walks in with arms open wide. The second one is, a lantern swings in the ocean breeze, a lantern swings, look at it. I sure do love how the lantern looks. Wow, it is so bright. After listening to those two poems, hopefully you can tell that one is probably clearly better than the other. But let's break it down and actually give some reasoning as to why. So the things that we're looking for here is the, does the poem make sense? Is it a good poem? And what would you prefer? The first poem here has a pretty nice rhyme scheme with breeze, trees, tide, wide. While the second one doesn't really make any sense at all with breeze, it looks and bright. And the final thing we typically do with most rating jobs like this, uh, we will just give a quick explanation for anyone reviewing our work. And we would just say something like the first poem is good because of the rhyme scheme. It meets the user's needs and it's just a pretty entertaining poem overall. And then we will state that the second one is bad basically for the complete opposite reasons. Uh, it is very repetitive. It has basically no rhyme scheme and it frankly just sucks as a poem. For the next prompt here, we will be using set me a reminder email for 5 p.m. this weekend for the gym. Actually, can you change that to 2 p.m.? Thanks. Okay, and our first response was, just a quick reminder to hit the gym at 2 p.m. this weekend. Whether it's Saturday or Sunday, lock in that session and keep the momentum going. You've got goals, and this one is a step closer. The second one is setting a reminder for 1 p.m. three days from now. Can I help you with anything else? So exactly like the previous prompt, we want to see that it actually meets our needs here. And right off the bat, we can see that the first one did set the time properly for 2 p.m and it did set it for this weekend. While it didn't set an exact day, it just said Saturday or Sunday, which should be okay for now. For the second one, it's wrong for a few reasons here. The obvious reason is it set it for the incorrect time at 1 p.m., and it just said three days from now, 
And so this can be an issue because we don't actually know what day it is today. So if today was, let's say, Monday, three days from now is actually totally useless. And finally, one other maybe not so obvious mistake here is the grammar with C not being capitalized and anything not being spelled properly. So this question is actually probably more important than the other ones because this doesn't just show up on the data annotation exam. It actually shows up on some other exams as well related to the field. And this prompt would be, give me five book recommendations. And then the follow-up question would probably be something like, which book would be a bad recommendation? And of course, since we can't use chat GPT or any other large language models, we would essentially just Google or research each one one by one. And we would eventually find out that the odd one out in this case here down here would be the Night Circus, and that's because it stands out as the only fictional and imaginative narrative among a list of self-improvement-focused nonfiction titles. So pretty obviously different from the rest. So for this, our prompt is going to look something like, give me the life and story of Albert Einstein. At first glance, there's nothing immediately wrong with any of the information that's being provided to us, and that is one of the first things that we do want to check. Is everything factual and accurate? So moving down our list here, what can really separate these two responses? And if you pay close attention to this intro here, you want to pay attention to how concise a response is and if something is kind of just a bunch of useless fluff words. And these fluff words or sentences can just include a, a useless introduction and conclusion and then just kind of a lot of repetition kind of repeating the same information over and over again. That would be basically completely useless to the average user. So when everything else seems roughly equal, we can then break down the formatting of a response and just how concise it is. And for the people who have watched my other videos, this question might sound a little familiar. The prompt would be something like, just summarize the Matrix for me. And then the first response is, The Matrix is a sci-fi action film directed by the Wachowskis, starring Keanu Reeves as Neo, a computer hacker, blah blah blah, we all know the movie. And then the second one is, The Matrix is a 1999 film, sci-fi thriller, starring Matt Damon as Neo. And then further along here, we see that he also teams up with Denzel Washington as Morpheus and Angelina Jolie as Trinity. So for people who are maybe movie buffs or familiar with this exact movie, the first response here is obviously right, and the second one is incorrect. So we just want to look for little inaccuracies. And just as one more quick tip here, for someone who might not know every movie off the top of their head, a really quick thing you can do to see how accurate one response might be in comparison to another is just see if there's anything that's obviously changed here. So you could immediately go check the actors. And just making sure that all the actors' names line up, the name of the movie is obviously correct, and what date it was released. So any sort of like name or number, you kind of want to compare in both responses just to make sure that everything immediately lines up before you have to do a little deeper dive. Okay, and finally to the last question, and just like before, this question kind of pops up with a lot of these jobs because it does require some creativity. Just as an example, you'll be having a lot of conversations with these models, so you definitely want to be able to come up with new and different conversations every single time. It is definitely frowned upon to just kind of keep going back to the same thing over and over again. Kind of like I do with the Matrix. And so, speaking of just being creative, you can kind of just test your ability here. As an example, a question might be like, give me a random topic. Okay, the topic is, let's do, I guess, psychology of nostalgia. That sounds like a weird one, but I'll see what I can do. And then what they're going to ask you to do is probably make like a six to eight sentence long story. Or if you're actually in production, you will be actually having a conversation maybe on this topic, right? And then especially for questions that involve some sort of creativity, you definitely don't want to just copy something from the internet or use chat GPT because that's going to get flagged pretty quickly. So yeah, for these creative prompts, honestly, just try your best, you know? It is always good to have a few tools to be able to pull on. What I might do in this situation is definitely talk about my own life experiences that I know to kind of start the conversation. And if I actually didn't have anything super relevant, I would either try to make it up and pretend, or I would actually try to call on other people's stories I may have heard, or maybe something I would have read. So finally, putting all the pieces together, I would be like, when I was a kid, I was very nostalgic for, let's say, the ocean. I had a lot of fun going to the ocean with my family. And that's because I just love having off for the summer. I love being around my family. Who doesn't love going swimming? And of course, all the good, like, you know, new food you get to try. So honestly, the most important piece of advice is definitely just avoid these sort of templated conversations where you always are given a topic and you always attack it the same exact way. You kind of want to keep it open, whether it's a topic that you're familiar with, maybe unfamiliar with. And, you know, it could be a learning process for you. And you can actually have like a really engaging conversation with the model that will hopefully, you know, lead to some errors or some like really good splits. And if it's more of an exam question, then, you know, you're practicing coming up with something on the fly, which is always useful. And speaking of things on the fly, if you're finding this video helpful so far, consider subscribing.
If you thought, wow, those are some awesome graphics being used, where could I get them? I got some good news for you. I source all of my high quality images and videos from Vectezi, which is one of the fastest growing creative marketplaces, offering millions of high quality stock photos, 4K videos, vectors, <laughs> get it? And weekly pro only bundles like fonts and presets that add huge value. While free downloads exist, the real power is Vectezi Pro, which gives unlimited downloads all for the low price of $9 a month billed annually, which of course I take full advantage of as you can tell. And you should too. And that's because you have simple licensing, commercial rights, no attribution requirements, so you don't have to worry about copyright issues when using their millions of videos and images. And you have access to a constantly growing library for a fraction of what premium sites charge. So if you're interested, check out my affiliate link in the description below. Thank you all so much for listening. Now let's move on to part two for my data annotation core assessment guide. Okay, and some quick notable mentions before we jump in here. This exam is 14 questions. If it kicks you back out to the home screen prior to doing all 14 questions, you can probably just assume that you failed. Also note the time limit. I believe it says it's about 45 minutes to 90 minutes. Definitely make sure you do not submit it any faster than 45 minutes. It seems like most people usually spend a little over two hours anyway, so you should be okay. Also, even if you do do everything right, you could still be flagged for other reasons such as your location, or they may not just be hiring. With that being said, I'm going to teach you everything that I know to help give you the best possible chance to pass. For those Raiders out there who may have already passed, you may still find this information helpful for general tasks. Let's start with the basics of how to rate every response you will see. This will be the number one thing for you to understand moving forward for this test, qualifications, and probably most projects on the platform. So pay attention. Each response will be scored using this rubric and these main categories to keep things simple for this particular exam. Does the response actually satisfy the user intent? That is, did it directly answer the user's question or request? Next. Is it factually accurate? Are the facts correct, current, and supported? Third, is the response clear? Is it easy to read and understand? Fourth, is it trustworthy and safe? Is it free from harmful, biased, or misleading content? And finally, formatting. Does it have bullet points? Is it in a list format? Or should we expect to see some sort of chart or table to make the information easier to read and understand? Okay, so let's jump into what everyone came here for, the main exam. So I'm actually going to separate these by categories. Some of the questions are basically just repeats of the same exact thing, just kind of worded a little bit differently. But the main categories that we'll be focusing on here are hallucination or misinformation errors that you should be looking at, creative prompts that are just kind of missing the mark, and then you're going to get some prompts that are not exactly wrong, but one is still clearly better than the other, and it more closely matches the user's needs. And then finally, sort of in that same vein, the response is just not following the user's prompt closely enough. One is just slightly better. Okay, and our first prompt is, what is the capital of Australia? And where can I learn more about it? For response A, we have the capital of Australia, Sydney. Known for its iconic opera house and harbor. You can learn more about Sydney's role as the political center of Australia at www.australiagov.sydney/capital. So of course, the first things we always want to check is the key information actually factual. So you look up, is the capital of Australia actually Sydney? And it is not. It is actually Canberra. 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 Okay, enough of that. And then second, we're going to check to see that this link actually works. So link's not verified. Just go ahead and give this a follow anyway. And of course, the link does not work. So pretty bad response so far. For response B, we have the capital of Australia is Canberra. Canberra. Uh, we already fact-checked that that is correct. Located in the Australian Capital Territory. You can learn more about Canberra's Canberra. history and government institutions on the official site here, www.australia.gov.au. And this website does work. Okay. And then to sum things up here, we would say response A contains a hallucination. The, halluc the hallucination being it's an incorrect capital and a fake URL. The URL does not actually work. Uh, we would also say response B gives the correct information with a real verifiable source. And government sources are usually some of the best trusted sites out there. So that's always good to note as well. You always want to mention response A and response B, what's good with them, what's bad with them. Okay, and up next, our prompt will be write a four-line poem about time slipping away. The two main things that we want to check for the responses are that they're each four lines long, and they're both about time slipping away. So for response A, we have time's the thing that moves. It keeps going every day. People notice it sometimes. It is always happening. And for response B, we have a shadow crawls across the wall. The echoes fade, the night birds call. I reached a hold a single day. But time just smiled and slipped away. So right off the bat here, they do both involve time, but response A just kind of falls a little bit flat, not having any sort of noticeable rhyme scheme. So I would go with response B here is better. And then your reasoning could be response A lacks rhythm, imagery, or emotional impact, making it feel flat and forgettable, which I completely agree with. 
And response B delivers a poetic experience that reflects the theme with elegance and depth. Our next prompt is, what's a simple way to explain inflation to a middle schooler? Response A is, inflation is when prices go up over time and your money doesn't buy as much as it used to. And response B is, inflation is like when candy used to cost $1, but now the same candy costs $1.25. Your money didn't change, but what it can buy got smaller. So I think this is a perfect example of when both responses technically answer the question, but one is just clearly better. Obviously, response A didn't use any sort of verbiage that we would expect a middle schooler to understand. Response B at least tried to use a candy example. So we would say something like response A gives the definition but lacks connection or context. Response B uses a relatable example that makes the concept concrete and understandable for a middle schooler. I think we could all agree on that. At this stage in the exam, the answers would always be clearly right or wrong. A lot of times we'll be working on a sliding scale. You don't have to hit the perfect answer every single time, but you do need to land on the right side of the scale. That means using common sense, intuition, and judgment to figure out which response better helps the user, even if both seem okay on the surface. To make things easier, imagine you were the person writing that prompt. What sort of answer would you actually expect to see? What would be a bad answer? What would be an okay one? And what would be a perfect answer that couldn't get any better? And the last prompt here, this one might seem a little bit familiar. Follow me on this. The prompt is, write a short four-line poem about the ocean. Response A says, the ocean roars beneath the sky, waves crash and seagulls cry. Salted winds drift through the air, a restless world forever there. Okay. And then response B is, the ocean whispers in its sleep, a song of secrets buried deep. Its waves like thoughts come and go, telling tales we'll never know. Moonlight dances on its skin, tides pull dreams from deep within. A mirror for the sky's dark grace, endless shifting out of place. So you might notice probably two things right off the bat. One, they're two different lengths. And two, I would say that they're both different in quality. I would say response B is actually the better poem here. Response A is okay. It has like an, an all right uh, rhyme scheme, but nothing like insane. So when deciding which one is better, we're actually going to go with response A. Even though it's the worst poem, it more closely matches the user's prompt. Remember, they wanted a four-line poem and a poem about the ocean. This meets both of those criteria. Even though that this poem is technically better, it's still too long. It would technically be useless to the user. So we would say something like, even though response B is more poetic and expressive, it fails the prompt by going twice the requested length. Response A is clearly weaker, which I noted, in quality, but it follows the instructions exactly, which is often what matters most in assessment settings like this. And one more thing to mention, if all else is equal and both responses are about the same as far as responding to the user's prompt, always prefer one that is concise compared to one that is overly wordy. We want responses to have the correct amount of wording and information and nothing else. We don't want it to be fluffed. We don't want it to be overly long, sort of like this sentence right now. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, consider supporting the channel. Links will be in the description below.